Welcome to OL Nation session nine. And I'm very glad to welcome our participants from all over the country and all over the world. Welcome to viewers, Laurentians, young, old, and friends of Lovedale. This session is centered around the environment, the Nilgiris, the Todas, and sustainable environmental action. When I was a kid, environmental friendliness meant having a bath twice a week, so we saved water. I think that's about it. And I, if I'm not mistaken, in the 80s, we were told to plant acacia and eucalyptus all over the slopes adjoining grass pitch, prep school, pitches, flats, and stuff like that. Today, we know that probably that was not the right thing. But I'm an expert at this. We have subject matter experts, the headmaster, people of global repute here to share their stories with us. OL Nation is all about thought leadership, knowledge sharing, mentorship, and networking, of course. We've come a long way since we started last June, and we are very happy to have you here. To take things forward once more, we have Kalpana Kutaya from the batch of 1980, all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome, Kalpana, once more, and over to you. Thank you very much, Rohan. I'm happy to be on this session of OL Nation. School holds a special place for everyone, in all our hearts, in many ways. We have childhood friends to the place itself. But I don't think we knew very much about the place when we were growing up in school. So um, it, just to share with you all this session, we have three older ancients who know a lot about it, who have lots of contributions towards the conservation and preservation of the school campus and the environment in the Nilgiris. So let me give you a little outline of um, each of them. We have Gopi Krishna Warrior, Windya 1982, who's an environmental journalist. He's based out of Chennai and Trishur and is the managing editor for Mongabe India, an online publication that focuses on environmental and the conservation. Since 1987, he has written regularly about the environment for multiple organizations nationally and internationally. Gopi's work has appeared in India Climate Digest, Na uh, Nature India, Frontline Magazine, the News Media Minute, India Legal, The Times of India, The Hindu, First Post, Forbes India, and much more. You can also check his blog site, which is called A Touch of Green. Gopi is a secretary of the Forum of Environmental Journalism, a professional body of environmental journalists in India. He has worked with media in Bangladesh, Nepal, 
Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and India, of course, within, uh, with the reason to enhance journalism and understanding in climate change and biodiversity. We'll also have Dr. Tarun Chabra, who's a dentist and a founder of the Toda Nalavaya U Sangam. The Toda Welfare Society works in the indigenous Toda people of the Nilgiri Highlands and the EBR Trust which is engaged in ecological restoration and ecological and botanical studies in the upper Nilgiris. He has discovered many new species of plants in the Nilgiris, including three wild balsam, which were all given Toda nomenclature. He is the author of numerous articles, papers, and chapters on related subjects. His magnum opus is the Toda Landscape Explorations in Cultural Ecology, published by the Harvard University Press. His philanthropic activities include weekly food distribution to the poorest in Uti and providing free dental treatment on Fridays to all. And finally, we have Ajit Mathai, Vindya, 1981, whose educational background is an industrial engineer and a managing, management consultant. He's the founder of Mbiome, a transformation transformational consulting firm focused on sustainability and the founding member of BDAI Biodynamics, India's oldest organic farming association. The focus of Ajit's discussion today will be sustainable livelihoods. This has involved local governance, women, banking, and the carbon neutral Wynard program, all built on AHOPE, a mobile technology platform. His career includes corporate jobs with international companies, biotechnology, 10 years of hands-on earthworm farming, and environmental conservation. Recognizing the large-scale sustainable transformation requires working closely with the governments, Ajit spent 15 years in government consulting in India, Africa, and neighboring countries. He led some of the India's largest transformation projects, including restructuring the Indian Railways and the Food Corporation of India, just to name a few. Ajit currently combines his experience of agrarian and environmental transformation work with the experience of working with polit politicians and bureaucracy. He's a co-author of the book, Koya India, uh, Koya Kerala, I'm sorry, The Agenda for Modernization with the Koya Minister, T.M. Thomas Joe Isaac. With these introductions, let us get on with the conversations and we will have Gopi Warrior who will be the moderator and speaker for the session. Gopi, please unmute your mic and take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kalpana. Uh, thank, thank you for that introduction. Uh, let me, as the speaker and moderator, uh, welcome Ajit Matai, uh, Vindya 81, and Tarun Chabra, Vindya 81. You notice we have a bit of a Vindya conclave uh, this evening. So let's uh, let's start with that. Thank you. Thank you, Gopi. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in school, we sang uh, Nilgiri Hills, the home of our school days. Uh, we were hap happy that uh, happy in the campus that we lived in, in the cold and misty mornings, uh, the pitter patter of the rain, you know, which drenched our battle jackets. We walked with one 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 hand between the battle jacket uh, <coughs> buttons and one hand in the in the other pocket, the only pocket we had the smell of eucalyptus, scotch broom flowers, the grass tops, which we chewed while we sat on the 67th slope, Big Hill, Grass Pitch, Smith's Cave and the Reservoir. But even though we lived in this wonderful environment, we were not aware of the uniqueness of the environment in which we lived. We did not know that we lived in a, on a sky island. We were though living in the tropical latitudes because of the altitude, we were living uh, in, in temperate climates. We did not know, understand that the grasslands that we saw, the grass pitch and all the other grasslands that we saw was part of the native, uh, native vegetation. Neither did we understand that the Shola grassland ecosystem, that is the, the Shola, the thick forest, which we trekked into, Smith's Cave, etc. Uh, that was also part of the Nilgri uh, original vegetation. In fact, in, her, in our adolescent ignorance, we thought the uh, the, the eucalyptus trees, the eucalyptus and acacia were was native forests of Nilgiris. Uh, and we thought, you know, tea, tea and 
tea was native to Nail Greece. We took the flow of the streams that fed the reservoir, which gave us water, and the Lovedale Lake uh, stream for granted. Uh, we did not realize at that time that thousands of such streams uh, joined together and made four rivers which come out of Nail Greece, the Kavini, Moyar, Chalia, and Bhavani. And three of this, uh, the Kabini, Moyar, and Bhavani joined the, joined the Ka Kaveri. So we did not realize that uh, the, the water that we saw flowing all through the year in this little stream that provided water to reservoir, provided water, perennial water supply to the Kaveri, and all, which fed the farmers and, uh, and people of Tamil Nadu. After school and university, I, 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 I took to environment journalism and that's when I returned, kept returning back to uh, Nail Greece. Uh, I came multiple times uh, and every time I came, there was a new story, a uh, new change that was happening in the Nail Greece. Last when I visited uh, was uh, in March 2017, uh, I had visited to, to do a story on sacred groves of the Nail Greece. Uh, and, and that's the time when my classmate, Peter Ganser, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, the batch of 1981 is working on a project to conserve the Shola grasslands in five acres of the school campus. I, I met, the, met the then headmistress and uh, met, also met some of the students and, uh, and, and I'm surprised that those students, uh, unlike our time, were aware of the environment. We were not. We were not. I mean, as, as Rowan said, the only thing we did for the for the environment we were aware of is that we got a bath water only once in two days, uh, and and that was the transition that that I was very happy to observe. Both Tarun and Ajit uh, were uh, uh, you know were, were part of the were led the initiative that uh, for the project which happened in uh, in school. Let me start with Ajit. Uh, Ajit, uh, tell me, tell me more about the. Tell us more about how you got involved in the project. Gopi, uh, seven and a half years in perhaps the most beautiful school campus in the world had a lasting impact impact on me and a lasting impact on all of us. Uh, you know, the Lawrence gave us the license, and I think it was so important this license. Uh, the freedom, for instance, on a Sunday morning to pick up your lunch in a brown paper cover, vanish up towards the reservoir, up the big hills, drop down to the Smith's cave that you were talking about to paddle. It had such a lasting impact on all of us. It rubbed on beyond that. I had a classmate from, uh, uh, from Lawrence with me in REC Trinity, uh, Joy Chaco. We continue these trips, escapades into the mountains, into the grasslands, which actually uh, were so de delightful. Our first exposure to uh, the grasslands was actually during the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, where we traveled up, we walked into the Mukurthi sanctuary. And then after that, the goal uh, took me across the uh, the escape route, as it was called, between Munar and Kodeknal, again, high mountain grasslands, and those trips into every Kulam sanctuary that we would always make. Finally, uh, 30 years ago, 30 years after leaving uh, Lovedale on our 30th reunion, four of us, uh, Paul Matthew, uh, your namesake Gopu, uh, Senthil and I, did this beautiful walk down from cemetery to grass pitch laid on our back, looking up at the sky, and as you just mentioned, chewing grass. And then that was where the idea of restoring the grasslands of uh, Lovedale started. And given that we had such an expert amongst us, Tarun Chabra, uh, we thought no further. Evening when we met, we cornered Tarun and said, this is the project we have, can you take it forward? Yes, that's how it all started. Oh, that's, that's really nice. Uh, Tarun, uh, you, you were the hands-on person for this project, uh, you along with uh, Vasant. Can you tell us about it? 
Uh, yeah, basically, I would like to just say that my exposure to the Shola grasslands of the Nilgiris began in the 90s when I was on the managing committee of the Nilgiri Wildlife and Environment Association. And at, it was at that time I was doing my ethnographic uh, studies on the Toda traditional ecological knowledge. So it is a combination of these two things that led me to understand and realize that the Shola grassland climax ecosystem of the Nilgiris was actually a globally unique designated system. And it was uh, later when I started attending and being invited to address some international conferences that I uh, discovered that all over the world, people were taking up this rewilding or restoration movement. Whereas we in, in India were still waiting for the government and the forest department to do the needful. And I remember meeting people like Doug Tompkins, the founder of uh, the North Face. And I remember that his land trust, he made a presentation where they bought millions of acres of ranch land in Patagonia and they rewilded it. And then I discovered, found that, you know, in the Western countries, just like we commissioned the services of a plumber to fix our drainage, you can, they could just commission the services of a restoration ecologist to repair a, a specific ecotype. So it was then when I came back with this, that we, uh, Ramnik Singh, another OL who's going to speak, and I started this ethically not botanical refuge or EBR trust that works with ecological restoration. So we started this ecological restoration where we are restoring an entire T estate back to, to its Shola grassland wetland habitat using Toda traditional ecological knowledge. And we have a full-time ecologist working with us. So we've been working on this. We've also been like studying, uh, you know, the, the flora, rediscovering plants, uh, found, finding new species, and also conserving them and planting them onto this uh, area. But as far as the school is concerned, your most specific question was that, uh, you know, when, we, when the United Nations declared a particular year in 2002 as the year of the mountains, we, uh, my first thought was, you know, uh, why don't we uh, take, uh, participate and create this Guinness World Record on the Lawrence School campus? But it didn't work, although the, we did uh, carry out the Guinness World Record, which held for many years. But we weren't able to do it in school for some reasons. And then I took it up with Mr. Ramesh Venkateshan when he was the principal, and also discussed this with length at, uh, with Mr. Velapali when he was on the board. But finally, like Ajit mentioned, you know, when our batch started to discuss this, and they said, Tarun, just, you know, take it forward. It was then that I went and met uh, Mrs. Chima and also introduced her to Vasant and other people. And the bursa was also there. And we had a meeting and we planned this whole thing. And fortunately, the faculty was very enthusiastic about this. And uh, we were able to take it forward. And we were able to raise something to, to get about four or five acres ar around the reservoir, uh, you know, eco restored. And the children uh, participated in them. And I might also mention, you, you mentioned about uh, the children being more ecologically aware and sensitive. From the time of Mr. Lehari being the principal, I've been taking our children to not only Toda ceremonies, but also around the Nilgiri, showing them flora, what is native. And, you know, I've been doing that. For, for the last 20, 25 years, if not longer, with the kids. So that probably has an effect. And I've actually found uh, OLs who have met them, you know, younger ones in, at our at founders and saying, you know, it changed my life and things like that. So yeah, anyway. It's very, very, very interesting. I mean, from from the idea of uh, getting the idea from of restoration from Patagonia uh, and, uh, and, you know, they're building on it in uh, Lawrence School, Shola Grasslands of Lawrence School. Uh, we, we are very fortunate this evening because we have uh, the headmaster, Mr. Prabhakaran Nair with us. Uh, he, uh, and and this, the project that you started, uh, uh, your back started, uh, is, is continuing. And, and there are other uh, green initiatives that the school, school has uh, introduced. So uh, welcome, Mr. Nair. It's so nice to have you with us in this discussion. Uh, could you please tell us about the uh, green in initiatives uh, at school now. Well, good, good evening, uh, Mr. Kobi Krishna Warrior. Uh, first of all, it's something really great to talk about environment and uh, sustainable development. It's because, first of all, uh, all these uh, topics which we are discussing matters a lot in today's time. Um, I'm very glad that people like Tarun Chabra and a lot of predecessors have set a lot of foundation for me to start and children to carry on with the work. I can tell you that that Shola Grass project is still on just because of this COVID pandemic. Uh, the work is slightly going slow. Otherwise, uh, it's our regular activity project. And it's also attached to a program called IAYP. IAYP is International Award for Young People, where our children go and do service. And uh, this is a part of uh, our service. 
and it's going on along the reservoir. Uh, but however, uh, apart from that, we have made some add-on to the, the environment and sustainable development in three areas. Uh, number one is a water conservation front. Our school is the only school where there is no tube well. There is no utilization of underground water resources. And our school is the only school at the moment. We do not take or receive water from municipality or any water department. We just preserve the water in those check dams and reservoirs uh, with an effective water harvesting project. We utilize those water which is collected in the process of rainwater har harvesting and we use it throughout the year. For the past many years, this has been going on. Even in extreme heights of water shortage in Uti, we are better off by utilizing this uh, uh, flow runoff water. Second thing is that, what about the wastewater? Because 850 students and roughly around 300 staff members and their families staying here, every place where we inhabit certain amount of you know sewage is generated. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have we have introduced a ASTP system, uh, which is uh, based on um, you know integrated hydraulic. A filtration system with a biological component. There is no man-made inputs. There is no chemical uh, filtration associated with that. With the proper flow, uh, by utilizing the gradient, natural gradient, uh, the sewage water is treated in triple layer. And um, at the moment, we are using it for gardening and landscaping. But later on, we are planning to utilize it for various other uh, purposes. Other area is uh, um, energy conservation. If you look at the energy conservation, um, we have uh, near girls uh, junior school as well as near the ABC that is badminton uh, court and all. We have solar panel which is which is utilizing roughly around uh, uh, 30 kilowatts of solar power system is generated, which is used for heating. Though uh, the unpredictable weather in Neil Greece sometimes causes a bit of a disturbance, but it is a pilot project. It is going on, and uh, we are in the process of getting more and more support in that area. And uh, we have electric vehicles, buggies, for moving people from here and there. We are minimizing the use of fossil fuels, petroleum, and diesel ridden vehicles. So we are using the electric vehicles. Then recently, we have added a waste management system where the organic waste and is segregated. Uh, we have set up a small segregation unit um, near the cemetery area, and the waste is segre segregated, and it is processed. It is it is a it is a sort of a, a work which is organic waste in a in a aerobic composting process. We utilize a, a technology which is called aerobic uh, composting process with our sanitary workers segregate it and use that waste, and that waste. Uh, generally gen uh, is worked on for two to three days and we generate natural fertilizer which is used for a gardening purpose. There is no plastic. Uh, campus is completely declared as a plastic free zone and it is, it is very difficult uh, to get a you know, sort of zero plastic use but we are minimizing as much as we can and um, plastic consumption and plastic usage is completely minimized and you are working and more and more with zero plastic environment. And we have been awarded Swatch School Award in 2016 for various initiatives taken to protect the environment. And apart from these areas, there is, there is one more thing which we are working on it is uh, uh, our NCC, National Cadet Corps Pro Program, Pro, uh, uh, NCC unit, as well as our Nature Club unit. They are involved in cleaning up and working on the local environment. They tie up with the um, um, local authorities. Uh, for uh, clean Nilgiri projects. That is their contribution, which they're going on it. And uh, outreach program also consists of uh, once in a term, we go to tribal areas, uh, Gudalur, Pandalur, and Masinigudi. Our children stay there for five days. It's a part of our IAYP program. And we work and we support the tribal population there. We had about two to three camps organized in Gudalur, Pandalur area last year. Before that, we also visited, we also worked in, in Wynard uh, Flash Flood Relief Center where our children contributed and we had a, a camp out there and we also organized a round square camp to help and support a village school to rebuild which was very badly affected by the flash floods a couple of years back in Wynard. And uh, there are local areas like Manjikumbai and all, we do go for uh, geography project work and uh, um, Mr. Chabra is also some of the resource person help us in these areas and our children go work with them and also try to reach out and support this local population, uh, basically the tribal population. 
So these are the areas where we are working um, uh, systematically and uh, IGBC Green Campus Certificate with Platinum Rating has been awarded to us this year for this initiative. Again, these are the, the, uh, the program which is going on. There is no end to our initiatives. We are trying to add on more and more facilities, uh, more and more support to, for the sustainable environment and um, educate our children make them understand the value of a pure uh, environment, make them understand how precious the nature is. And uh, this is very much, uh, it, it's not a part of our curriculum, it's a part of our lifestyle actually. It has to be built into our lifestyle and our children are um, you know, working on in a very positive way. Thank you. Now over to uh, Mr. Gopi Krishnavar here. And thank you, for, thank you for, for giving an opportunity to speak these initiatives uh, to oil community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's so heartening to hear, you know, all the changes that have happened, uh, 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 happening in the recent years. Platinum rating, that's no mean achievement, you know, for, for the school system. Uh, water conservation, wastewater treatment, uh, waste segregation, and energy conservation, you know, solar plant. Uh, so it's, it's something that's really uh, done well. I mean, uh, Ajit and Tarun, maybe we, are, we studied in school at the wrong time, perhaps. <laughs> we had, uh, perhaps we had the opportunity to study at this time, we would have, uh, uh, we, we would have perhaps learned more. <clears throat> Mr. Nair, and lovely hearing about what's happening in the school. I just wanted to know uh, what, what is the development with the Shola project uh, that we started the batch. At that, uh, uh, thank, thank you. That four and a half, five acres of uh, area, which is the amount for Shola plantation, still going on. And it is just uh, on top of the reservoir. So on a regular basis, uh, right now it is slightly, uh, because students are not here, our movements are restricted. Uh, once the students come, we take them on a regular basis. So once in a week, each class uh, goes along with the teachers and they maintain it, they remove the weeds. And it is it's going on very well. And, and fortunately, that area has a lot of water logging, the space, you know, there is a lot of moisture in the soil. So the grass, it is, is going on well. We are planning, we are planning to extend it to slightly further up. Uh, and again, um, it's, it's a matter of time. It's, it's closer to our heart that will continue and we'll make it uh, more and more, extending it in more and more areas in those regions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for sparing your time and thank you for updating <coughs> us on this, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the green front in school. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ajit and Tarun, uh, that was very interesting. Uh, with the headmaster joining and uh, telling us about the project, uh, about your project, and also the green initiatives uh, that the school has launched. Uh, so, uh, I mean, as I said earlier, perhaps we were in the wrong, we were in the school at the wrong time. But uh, since school, uh, all of us have sort of uh, we didn't have environmental education or in, of any kind in school, but uh, we uh, we we got into the field of environment. Uh, so I just want to go into that. I mean, uh, Tarun, I mean, uh, you're, a uh, you're a practicing dentist and, uh, and, and you, you are a respected uh, TODA uh, authority on TODAs. Uh, your book, uh, book that is published, uh, your TODA landscape that is uh, published by Harvard University Press, uh, the, school, the School of Asian Studies, Department of Asian, South Asian Studies of Harvard University. And... Orient Black Swan, that's my classmate's uh, company. Uh, Orient Black Swan, Krishnadev Rao's company, and, and it was published in 2015. And, and you're acknowledged as a, uh, as a, as a uh, TODA scholar. Um, and uh, uh, your scholarship uh, about, uh, your scholarship is uh, acknowledged. And uh, in fact, a couple of years, uh, um, you, a couple of years ago, you discovered a few species of balcom, balsams in, in the Toda landscape and you had them named, given Toda names. How did you get interested in working with the Toda and Toda culture and environment? Well, Gopi, it all began on that fateful day in, back in 1990 when I was a young dentist in my mid-twenties and I happened to visit the Defence Services Staff College Library here and incidentally, I'm now a guest lecturer at the Defence Services Staff College lecturing on Neil Gris. Uh, and I was looking for this book on Indian philosophy to learn to study more on that topic. 
And when I was going from one shelf to another, I happened to glance upon a book by W.H.R. Rivers, curiously titled The, the Todas, written about almost a century earlier. And at the end of the uh, journey to the trip to the library, I came back with this, not with a philosophical tome, but with this book by Rivers. And when I was perusing that and reading that, that changed my life forever. And I started visiting Toda Hamlets, uh, their ceremonies and, uh, and interacting with them. And one of the first things I realized at the very first time was that there's a concept of Toda time. You know, like we had, used to listen to that song by Eric Clapton called Living in Tulsa Time. I realized that you have to live in Toda time if you want to enjoy that. So if I went for any ceremony, which was going to be over, uh, maybe in half an hour or one hour, I always took the entire day off to absorb everything from that time uh, onwards. And in you, fact, you mean to say years, there's, there's something like a Toda stretchable time, like like our stretchable time, which is exactly, uh, exactly, yeah. So it's it's like a concert, it's a Toda time. So it's it's better to, uh, you know, just be in that. In fact, when I go and camp at Toda places and uh, for many years now, I make sure that uh, uh, you know, even Ramnik who and I, when we go out, we take out our watches also. Forget about cell phones. I say we take out your watch and keep it away for twenty for two days. And so that we can be in, in tune with, in, with Toda time. And in fact, over the last uh, 30 years, uh, all my knowledge and ex, uh, exposure to biodiversity and the ecosystems uh, has been through the Toda perspective. Interesting. We'll come to that. We'll come to more details about that. But, uh, uh, you know, what uh, I, uh, something that, that really fascinated me about uh, your work on Toda's I must I must share one uh, incident. Uh, I met an old Laurentian, uh, a generation junior to us, you know, and uh, she was surprised that uh, I become an environment journalist. She said, you're an old Laurentian and you've become an environment journalist. And I said, uh, then you haven't met Arun Chabra. I mean, you're, you're, uh, you say I've, I've gone into a narrow field, I've become an environment journalist. I mean, then, then think of Arun Chabra who's gone into so much of depth, uh, just studying Todas. Uh, Ajit, uh, you, uh, while uh, Tarun worked with uh, Todas, you worked with farmers. You're, you uh, are an engineer uh, uh, and you are a management expert. You worked with uh, consulting, government consulting, etc. How did you get involved with the farmers? And that too, why not? So just, just uh, 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 how did you get involved? Yeah, uh, there are probably two parts to this answer. The first is the travel, and I would probably relate uh, to the the gap year I had between uh, REC and uh, joining XLRI, which I used to sort of hitchhike, uh, you know, living on railway platforms across India, uh, going up to Rishikesh at Haridwar for the Kumbh Mela, then hitchhiking on a lorry all the way down to Calcutta, and then finding winding my way back uh, home in South India. That le le led a, left a lasting impression. My consulting years, uh, uh, last with Deloitte, uh, took me to every corner of India, every state and every, literally every corner of India, from Lakshadweep to the Thar Desert, to the Kashmir, to the Bailadilla mines in uh, Chhattisgarh, to all the states of the, the frontier states in the Northeast. Uh, go people, what, uh, you know, sadly, uh, I realized is that except for pockets, there is nothing left as pristine in India. There's no pristine nature left in India. What I did realize was that unless we engage people, we engage governments to start working with us, we are not going to be restoring the environment. And the environment is in a crisis, doesn't matter where you are, Central India, the Northeast or the, uh, out in the deserts. Another thing that actually uh, influenced me a lot was uh, I started my working uh, with a, a biotech firm, a cutting edge of biotechnology firm called Pharmacia, uh, uh, way back in '88, and uh, worked with the likes of uh, Kiran Mazundar on our labs, tissue culture, and uh, fermentation, and so on. Uh, came up into the Kodekanal and started the India's first organic farming movement. The so Bidani. the Pali Hills Conservation Council, is that, the, is that what? PHCC and uh, the Biodynamic Association of India 
which became uh, it's the oldest uh, Demita is the brand that we own. Uh, yeah. the oldest, I had I had, repeat, I had reported about this uh, I think in the late 1990s. Uh, yes. Go on, Ajit. Yeah. Okay. Um, my work now uh, and the embryome that we have now created is actually a hybrid of these three things. That is the realization that ecology needs help. Uh, ecology, as uh, you know, Attenborough and uh, played a you know played a very influential role when you his uh, 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 his show on uh, the living planet and so on. Ecologies need restoration. Ecologies need help. Ecologies need a government. Ecologies need people. How do we actually need large scale transformation in these areas? Became the focus of my work. Ecologies need help. Ecologies need restoration. Ecologies need government. Ecologies need people. So that's that's what you're uh, you're you're building to all the all the structures that's needed and connecting uh, economy and, uh, and 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 ecology. We'll come to uh, more discussions on this uh, uh, as we go on. Uh, uh, but tell me one thing: both of you guys were batchmates, weren't you? Uh, so I, 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 uh, you were in India together. That that much I know. Maybe you were in uh, junior school houses also together. There's something about uh, I've heard some story about some shared cupboard, shared Benadryl, uh, you know, something like that. Can you can you tell? Yes, uh, I can talk about that. Uh, class eight, uh, little dorm in Kailash house. Uh, Tarun was sleeping next to me. He had, you know, uh, he had this huge quilt. And uh, uh, a white quilt, I remember, and which made his bed always untidy, but it looks looked very big. Uh, we shared a cupboard, and uh, I think his father was fairly generous about the Benadryl uh, bottles that you'd leave behind. And Saturday evening was a good time to have a a, a little swig of Benadryl before going to bed. Chabra was, uh, yeah, yeah, he was asthmatic. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was unfit. I mean, he could. Uh, he would, we called him the duck. He would waddle around. That this chabra that we knew of class eight today sort of uh, runs across the Nilgiris and uh, with the Todas. I mean, it's quite unbelievable that uh, Tarun, the transformation that has that you've actually created with yourself. Maybe the Benadryl was what gave him, uh, took him to the Todas. Uh, Tarun, is that true? <laughs> Perhaps. Who knows? Yeah, uh, the, the, Tarun, uh, you know, when I met you first time uh, in after school, you know, I, I, as I told you, I was, uh, even when I started reporting in uh, in the Neil Gris, uh in, in early 1990s, mid 1990s, I was uh, for, first for Down to Earth magazine and then for the Hindu Business Line newspaper. Uh, I, I used to hear about you. I used to hear about the work that you were doing. You had this small clinic near uh, Kurunjis and uh, you, uh, people are already talking about you as a, a dentist who has become a Toda expert. Uh, I met you first time after school in 2017 and I was doing this uh, uh, this re field reporting on sacred groves of the Nilgiris and then you uh, ref uh, you referred me to a couple of Toda hamlets and I traveled with uh, Torte Kutan uh, to these hamlets. And uh, that's when I realized, I mean, when I was talking with people, I realized the, the Toda way of life, the Toda culture, the Toda uh, way of life was very deeply, uh, you know, ingrained with the ecological, uh, uh, what, what they saw, they, the natural resources and, and the ecological resources. I'm sure you can tell us, but you have worked your whole life on this. You can tell us more. You can give us some examples on this. The See, right, Toby. Sacred yeah. hills, sacred mountains, yeah. sacred river. You're very right about it. In fact, un, uh, quite expectedly, the Toda relationship with nature begins right from birth, when the neonate is a silent spectator to the elaborate birth rites performed by his or her mother that entail the use of a number of specified plant species that cannot be substituted. And that is followed by the naming ceremony, where just at the crack of dawn, a proud grandfather uncovers the child's face and points out the rising sun, the sacred rocks, the birds, the pools, uh, the buffaloes, the, the temples, and everything, uh, the, the sacred elements of the la landscape to the child for the first time, and also then announces his or her name, and which incidentally is derived from the sacred landscape again. 
Now, a Toda prayer is nothing but the quasim or sacred words that the priest chants to the sacred elements of the say, landscape. It may be the rocks, pools, trees, whatever, pathways, etc. And then he gives the child its name. And uh, I, incidentally, all the rites of passage that the Todas follow from birth up to death entail the use of a number of plant species that cannot be substituted. So, and some of them take place at night. For example, the pregnancy ceremonies take place in the pitch darkness of the new moon night. And eight species of plants are to be used that cannot be substituted. So that it, it goes without saying that all these species have to be found abundantly in the natural landscape around each and every Toda hamlet that may not have more than 10 to 15 to 20 inhabitants. And for that, these 100 species at least, which they use in the rites of passage have to be protected. And if you go back in time, the, uh, during the dream time, the, when we can look at the three irrevocable bonds that the Todas had with nature. The first was when the Todas, who lived in human form, left their bodies, as they believe, and they took up residence in hills, where they are still believed to reside as deities. And one of the first things I re realized by, uh, in the early days was, if, if you ask an Toda elder, which is the abode of the god Conte, he will not point out because it's sacrilegious to do so. So they would often point at the peak on the right of it and say the peak to the left of that. And then I realized you should not you know, do that. And then you have the sacred, uh, uh, the second link with nature. So you know when you have hundreds of peaks with, or hills which are sacred, that was the first connection with nature. The, the second bond with nature in ancient time took place when the uh, goddess Tekiji allotted sacred sites to the landmarks or the, or the landscape. So overnight, so to speak, uh, thousands of elements of the na natural landscape had sanctity was san sanctified, and they have sacred prayer names which they call kwasham, which are still chanted by the priest to specific uh, landmarks, be be they hills, slopes, rocks, trees, water bodies, etc. So that was the second link with nature in ancient times. The third one took place when the god En realized he says that his people, their spirits, don't have a place to reside. So he said, "I will set up an afterworld." where people who have performed all the rites of passage using all the specific species of plants, they will take the same journey and reside at this afterworld. So these are the three ancient links with uh, nature in ancient times. And uh, you can see this even today, you know, the Toda knowledge about, they, they use the seasonal flowering cycles of plants to indicate not only all the seasons of the uh, year, but also the stages of each season of the year. And they can, it precisely, they use the flower, they use, a flowering plants to indicate a person's anxiety levels. They have a gentian, which, you can, which is known as arkil poof and toda, which means the worry flower. Why the worry flower? Because if you pluck this and hold it by the stem, if you're worried, the petals will close. And it's so accurate that if you're very worried, it'll close in a flash, otherwise it'll take some time. So they have been having this intimate relationship. Now when, uh, again, for their architecture, their, their, their conical temples and their barrel vaulted temples, not a single nail is used. Specific species of bamboos, thatch, etc. So they knew that this avul or elecrisis rangachare has specific properties that they can use it for a thatch grass. The, the bamboo that they call tef has remarkable tensile strength so they can bend it when it's green to give it uh, the barrel vaulted shape, etc. So they have a phenomenal traditional ecological knowledge that I've been learning all the time, uh, even the floral knowledge. And you know, um, uh, they don't, their taxonomic knowledge is different. They don't, in normal taxonomy, when we discovered, when we wanted to identify the thatch grass, we had to find flowering spikes and send it to Kew Garden for identification. But the Toda can identify the same grass uh, in the wetland from half a kilometer away, whatever its phenolog phenological state, it doesn't have to be flowering. I also, uh, to give you one uh, example also, uh, I remember once seeing an insect had built a kind of a, a nest on a tree. And the Toda elder said, you know, this insect doesn't build this hive itself. It gets another insect to do its work for it. And I said, how can it be? I just uh, laughed it away. I said, how can an insect get another uh, insect to do its chores for them? Until I read this paper by Edward O. Wilson, you know, the great ecologist, yes. where it was entitled, it was called Slavery in Ants. And then I realized what uh, this great ecologist had discovered, the Todas knew from, from ancient times. So this is an intimate link. I can go on and on, yeah. you know, about this, about the flowers. Yeah. And, Fascinating, fascinating, Tarun. I mean, starting with ecology, ecological knowledge, right from the time a child is born to the child, till the time the child takes the various stages of progression, uh, and and then to death and afterlife, and and then the knowledge, uh, um, knowledge, traditional knowledge of the biodiversity. It's not just uh, that 
the understanding of the biodiversity, but also the traditional watch. We'll come to that when we talk about uh, uh, biodiversity and bio, you know convention, etc. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 one thing I was very fascinated and I wanted to ask you, and I'm sure uh, there are a lot of people who will who, ask you this question. You know, when I, when I went with, uh, uh, went with uh, Torte, the language that they spoke was not uh, any similar to, it was not similar to any Dravidan language that we know, we hear normally, you know, uh, Tamil, Malayalam, uh, Kannada, Andhra. So uh, is there any truth in in the uh, in the todas having come from elsewhere, or have they been natives of the Nilgiris itself? Yeah, it's it's a very good question. And uh, uh, Gopi, uh, basically, the toda has been uh, described now by linguists to be a South Dravidian language, but with highly aberrant uh, phonetics, and that makes it so difficult for people to understand, pronounce. I may be the only outsider who speaks... Sounds and yeah, all that. Yeah. I may be the only to outsider who speaks uh, Toda, whereas scores of uh, people uh, may be speaking Badaga or Kurumba and things like that. Yeah. So that's how difficult so just, it is considered, yeah, yeah, yeah. considered because of the aberrant phonetics system. So it's quite difficult to pronounce, leave alone write. You know? For example, when you go and meet a person, you say, how are you? You say, Ultishya. And then when you're going away, you say, I'll, I, you know, I'll go and come back. You'll say, on fish, fashkin. And I, and you know, quite often when I've been taking out children from Lawrence school to these Toda hamlets, I say, how was the trip? And you know what the kids answer? They say, it was awesome. And then I say, you know, every Sunday is awesome for a Toda. They don't get the joke. I, I, I just laugh within, I don't explain. But the joke is, uh, the explanation is that the word uh, for Sunday in Toda is awesome. So when I say every Sunday is awesome for a to for a to uh, they don't get the joke. Only I get the joke. So uh, you know that's how the that's how the language is. You know. So yeah. so basically, did they originate here? So we all came out of Africa, obviously. Yeah. And if you and the Todas will tell you that we had a miraculous. Uh, you know, they have a mythological story of how they were created in the hills. But of course, they they obviously have moved in. We know scientifically, and linguistically, it has the the language has been. Uh, rated to be oh, at least two and a half thousand years old. We don't know how much older than that by linguists. And you might have read a report, a uh, very recent report in the last, uh, the scientific paper by a team from Indian Institute of Science, and I, uh, by, done by my good friend Raman Sugumar and his team. Mm. Uh, the elephant man. They, the elephant, yeah, man. The elephant yeah. man. And yeah. uh, if you see that paper, now they have proved, because they've done some digging, you know, mm. in the uh, Wenlock Downs on the peat bog, yeah. and found that there was buffalo dung, mm. and there were some carbon residue. Yeah. And uh, so, and dated to be three and a half thousand years old. Yeah, so I, saw, I saw that paper. Uh, yeah, I saw that yeah, paper. Yeah, so it was a pastoral group. Reported. Yeah, we exactly. So, that from, so from that, they've deduced that it has to be the Todas because they're living right around that area even now, a pastoral. So now we know that the Todas have been around for at least three and a half thousand years. And just to conclude, uh, you know, we, our uh, 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 Toda Nalvalva Sangam, we have a project, ongoing project uh, with Harvard University and Cornell just to do the genetic studies in great detail. And it's only because yeah. of the pandemic that it's got deferred a bit. And uh, so they'll be coming back hopefully by the end of this year when things cool off and we'll be doing a very detailed study. They'll be coming from America, they're Indian. And very uh, interestingly, you'll be interested to learn. I heard from this team that one of the geneticists who will be joining us perhaps with this thing is an old Laurentian. That's an awesome answer, Tarun. That's an awesome answer. If I, I mean, now I know there's a, uh, there's another word to, uh, there's another meaning to the word awesome. Uh, but just to give context to uh, uh, to those who do not perhaps understand the Nilgiri uh, Nilgiri cultural ecosystem as much as uh, you do, the Todas are the pastoralists, pastoralists uh, community, uh, the Badagas who who are the main agriculture community. And they got their name Badagas uh, because uh, they came from the north. That's or that's that's how the that's how the uh, the, the understanding is. Not not uh, not North India, but they came India, from the Mysore, north of, Mysore area. They came from the yeah. Mysore area, which is uh, immediately north of the the Nilgiri. North of, yeah, and after the after the uh, after the battle of Patli, uh, after the battle of Talikota, when uh, and then the it started in different different. Uh, uh, different sets of migration and people who came from uh, present-day Karnataka into the Nilgiri. So, so that's that's more that's the Badaga population and Kotas are the Kotas are artisans. Uh, they are weavers and uh, pot makers. 
the Kurumbas and Irulas are hunter gatherers. So, just to give a context on uh, on 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 the population, uh, in and and when we talk of uh, Nilgiris, we are talking of Nilgiris, the plateau, uh, and and that's the, that's upper plateau of Nilgiris, and also the extended Nilgiri biosphere reserve, which is all the way north from Kodagu to the Palghat Hills. You know, so so when uh, uh, when Ajit talks about Wayanad. He is talking about the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. So you need to also mention here, Gopi, uh, Gopi, that the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, which extends over five and a half thousand square kilometers, encompasses three states. Yes. Right. It, li it lies at the trijunction of three Indian states, uh, and that that was the very first biosphere reserve in all of India 1980s, in 1986. 1980s, so it's very important. Yes. And the Toda country or the Nilgiri, you know, core, what I call the Toda landscape of the country, that lies at the core core of the NBR, the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. And we are very uh, fortunate that when the government of India had to select one biosphere reserve for, for the UNESCO, they selected this. When they have these amazing ecosystems in the Himalayas, uh, Western and Eastern Himalayas, Northeast India, and they selected the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. So we're and very so proud interesting, of that. Sorry, so interesting, Tarun, you're, you're bringing this up because uh, uh, the whole concept of biosphere reserve, which, uh, which began with the Nilgiri, as Tarun men mentioned, now, of course, we have something like 50 biosphere reserves in, in the country. Uh, the, the whole concept is, is how do you bring uh, economic activity, conservation, ecological activities, uh, all that together. Uh, biosphere reserve is more of a conceptual, uh, uh, conceptual uh, element. So uh, it's uh, how do you bring or multiple. So, so this is where, uh, you know, uh, why, uh, going back to Ajit, you know, your work in uh, Vainar, you're working with the, uh, and in the context of the biosphere reserve, uh, you know, context, your work in Vainar becomes so important. Uh, you've been working with uh, coffee plantations, uh, coffee planters in Vainar, and, and local gardens, the communities, uh, and also you had a system, uh, you're talking about a system on agroforestry, uh, tree, tree mortgage. Uh, what is it? I mean, what, what is this supposed to do? So Gopi, I'm going to wind back to the uh, the Shola project in school, and you know my, my work is about taking you know the immense knowledge of scientific knowledge and expertise of people like Tarun um, into action, into large scale transformation action, into a lot of areas that people like Tarun are perhaps not comfortable with, and this doesn't matter whether it is. Uh, whether it's at the school level, at the state level, at the country level, or even at the national level, the building principles remain the same. And what are these principles? So let me relate it to the school context and discuss the why not context. In school, uh, find the experts, find the people who can do it. Uh, Tarun Chabra, Vasant Bosco identified. We, ha we, knew the, we had the people who knew the job and knew how to do it. First stick achieved. The second, get the governance involved. Uh, in school governance, we are talking about uh, the, the the headmaster. Uh, in, in the, when we did this, it was Sangeeta. Uh, the governing body. Headmistress at that time, yeah. Uh, the OL, the OLs, our own batch to get involved. That becomes the second part of it. How do you get the OLs and the governance interested? In? The third part is about getting the finance organized. All this costs money. So how do you write reports? How do you get uh, reports of uh, proposals that are going out for CSR funding to the, the forest department and uh, the DFO and OT to the uh, conservator of forests? in Chennai to the Ministry of Environment and Forest in Delhi. Having done that, you've got the resources, you've got the funds, then you start mobilizing people on the ground. Here were the students, the teachers, and then all the practical things start falling into place. This is the school context. Now let us zoom out into a Vainad, uh, a biodiversity hotspot, uh, if there is one, perhaps the most critical of on the Western Ghats. Wayanad is, you know, uh, uh, it's the land landscape is hundreds and thousands of small farms. 
uh, every one of them is growing coffee. We have reduced coffee in Vienna to a commodity. Uh, the beautiful Robusta coffee that is grown uh, is sold as a commodity that goes to Nestle's or to any other uh, instant coffee unit who's not interested in the coffee but the, um, the caffeine in it and therefore is looking at coffee at the bottom, of the lowest price at the, as a commodity. How do you transform this? The land of Wynard could have biodiversity, could have trees planted, could have diversity in crops, diversity in animal husbandry, but you see very, very little of it in Wynard. You see mono, monocrops of coffee and people in, in fairly deep poverty. In, uh, uh, none of the farmers have money there. How do you lead this transformation on? So it actually started with uh, 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 the co-author of the book, uh, and I have the privilege of uh, working with him, uh, Dr. Thomas Isaac, who attended the 2015 Paris Protocol. Uh, two carbon neutral projects were identified in India. Uh, one was the Riverine uh, Island on the Brahmaputra, the Manjuli. Manjuli, Manjuli, Manjuli Island in Assam, yeah. In a panchayat in Vietnam. This That's Manjuli. Minangadi, isn't it? Minangadi, isn't it? Minangadi panchayat, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's where we started. Um, we got, as I said, the governance involved. We've got the uh, panchayat presidents of Minangani. We've got the panchayat president. Thomas Isaac came in and he called in all the panchayat presidents and secretary. We got the MLAs uh, involved and suddenly you had the governance in place. Then we arranged the funds. Uh, we got the uh, uh, 150 plus crores that came in into, to start this program. Thomas Isaac announced the, uh, in his budget speech the Tree Mortgage Program that we've talked about. What is the tree mortgage program? You know, a, a farmer cannot wait for 20 years for a tree to grow and, uh, you know, grow its benefits. He needs money immediately. So what we actually did in this program was for zero to three years, we plant, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of trees were given out, endemic trees, but yet with uh, economic value, were given out to these farmers, covered under the MNREGA program, supported from say a zero to three years from seedling to sapling. Okay. Once it when, there's, up, when there's no earnings from the tree at that point of time. Pardon? When there's no earnings from the tree at that point of time. There's still no, no earnings, but uh, you know, once it becomes three years, once it becomes a sapling, it becomes an asset. And that's where we have used technology. We've geotagged these trees. We have drones that can actually map out these trees. It goes into bank registers as an asset. We have uh, institutes like PU Delft uh, from Netherlands working with us, Indian Institute of Science, Kerala Technical University, all working on this uh, project of carbon neutral wine. Uh, you know, once the tree is in the asset register, then we are in a position to give the farmer every year up to 60% of the asset value. At the end of it, the, you know, the, uh, the state can decide to say that we do not want the tree cut, keep it, and we will actually continue to uh, increase the value of the tree. Uh, these are some of the means by which, you know, projects that are, uh, would either be in microcosms, uh, would, can actually be scaled. And there is compromise. You know, we are talking about doubling farmer income and how are we going to double it? We are going to bed with the enemy with coffee. We are going to make the farmer earn money from commodity to a coffee that tastes good. And uh, coffee kiosks, 500 kiosks across uh, Kerala are going to be rolled out. The, the value of that goes back to the farmer. So yes, uh, you know, when we are looking at the ecological transformation, we probably have to go to bed with the eucalyptus tree first in the thing before we can create a restoration on the school campus. But this is the progress. And it's so essentially giving income to the farmers right from the time the tree, uh, you have, uh, uh, tree is uh, there. So that uh, there is a there is an incentive uh, for the farmer to maintain the tree over its life period. Yeah. I mean, otherwise the farmer has no incentive to make an investment on something which is going to give him economic returns after twenty years, and along with coffee. So, so really combination of that. that yeah. how, we've got technology which us which we can actually we can. I'll talk uh, when uh, a little later on the shift in economic model that we, have, we need to work. Okay. We, I'll come to that. 
Tarun, uh, coming back my, my, uh, to, to the, the, the very, very small Toda community, 1,500 to 1,700 individuals that are, that, that are there. Uh, what are the ecological challenges they are, they are facing? And uh, I mean, they are facing, but then they, they're facing some of these ecological challenges, which are, uh, which are part of the larger ecological challenges of the upper Nile Grease Plateau. So when I say the upper Nile Grease Plateau, that 2,000 meter uh, plateau, and when, when we talk of Vayanar, that's also a plateau, but that's a lower 800 to 1,000 millimeter plateau. Uh, the, the the most the, the uh, important thing that happened in the early days. Now I have a whole lot of these old pictures around my house here, uh, of Toda settings, you know, taken in the early days when the British came, and uh, you know the grasslands and the sholas are pristine, and there's no dams there. You know, there's no as you know, the, the all the lakes, the beautiful lakes in the Nilgiris are all artificial reservoirs. And uh, so the first was the dams when they started creating the, you know, the half a dozen dams in the Toda country. Can you imagine that? And I'll give you an example. One of the early dams was the Upper Bhavani Dam. And when they were building this dam in Upper Bhavani, they have these Toda deity hills known as Eze Mose. And these people started digging earth from these two deity hills to build this dam. And the, the, the Toda elders tried to protest and said, you can't do this sacrilege. But nobody listened to them. And lo and behold, uh, after a few days or weeks, uh, there was a landslide and some of the workers there, the, uh, they got buried below that. And then they stopped that and then they got earth from elsewhere and still built the dam. Uh, so uh, the dams were the first thing. And not only was that, the, the best wetlands got uh, flooded by, by these reservoirs. And also what happened was, this was followed by planting of these exotic trees of acacia, uh, eucalyptus, etc. And these yeah. two... Uh, combined in blocking the sacred pathways for the Todas to migrate from one hamlet to another. In many cases, just the dairyman priest and his buffalo herds. So the highest grade of Toda dairy temples, the Thi temples, the, the entire complex became defunct by the 1950s, thanks to the series of dams uh, and the tree plantations that came up. So that had a very bad effect. And the third thing is that, you know, the Todas, till about 40, 50 years ago, they used to herald the onset of winter by using fire sticks to set fire to the grassland as a ritual. And, you know, th these are fire sticks of Litsia Vaitiana, which I have right here. And incidentally, Toda still make fire for all their ceremonies only with these uh, fire sticks. So you hold this with your leg and you twirl it by friction. And this is how they make fire, whether it's a temple lamp or the funeral pyre even today. But this uh, ceremony of burning the grassland, which is actually not, not just a ritual, it was a, a direct ecosystem management practice that has been proscribed by the forest department. But now people are realizing that this has been, uh, a firing of pastures has been found beneficial in Yellowstone National Park. So, but unfortunately in India, uh, nobody listens to our uh, indigenous people, even though we are signatory to the CBD, the Convention for Biological Diversity, which states explicitly that you will utilize the uh, traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous people. Uh, so uh, these are some of the threats that the Toda people have faced, among many others that you mentioned that the general Nilgiri uh, is, yeah, is I've, facing. I've heard, about, I've heard other... about this. Yeah, I've heard about this. Uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, um, the Todas are traditionally raising fire, uh, setting fire in winter. And, and there was this school of thought at one point of time, which, uh, uh, which I think is now uh, disproved uh, that uh, the, the, the Shola grassland ecosystem is because of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the fire that Todas raised, you know, and they're seeing grasslands as the, as the restarting of the, uh, of, of the forest landscape, which is, which actually it's not, I mean, it's been proved that, uh, and, um, and you were mentioning, I think, uh, there's enough evidence to say that uh, the, uh, the Sholas have existed since the last uh, glacial maxima. Uh, so that is twenty to thirty thousand years ago. Last no, the grassland has existed. The grassland has existed for thirty thousand years, yeah. whereas the the, the the sholas are actually known as living fossils, because they're thought to be uh, remnants of what were once far more extensive forests, yeah. dating back to the time of Gondwana land, tens that's of millions right. of years ago. That's right. That's right. That's right. So so that's that's I think that's that's a work which uh, the the French Institute. Uh, and and uh, IAC and, and some uh, institutions abroad together did, did and they they found I think they, they started because I uh, I was uh, talking with uh, Ramesh Dr Ramesh of 
French Institute, and and he was talking about his research from 230,000 years to 30,000 years, and they they found that these were remnants of some of the forests which stretched deeper into Central India and all the way to Sri Lanka. So uh, very very interesting. Uh, Ajit. Back to you, uh, from the perspective of uh, farmers in Vyanad, uh, what, what are the ecological problems that, they, that the Vyanad plateau? It's, it, just to put it in context, it's an entirely different altitude. Uh, Vyanad till, uh, till around 1940s was, uh, was in the malaria belt and was not, not as populated as what it's today. And after the after hydro, uh, you know, the, the synthetic quinine came and uh, uh, and and which which is now back in discussion with COVID. That's when uh, the the mid range plateaus uh, got habited, uh, and uh, that people from southern Kerala moved in and other parts moved in. So, what are the ecological problems? I travel I travel just last week to Vainar and I noticed a lot of changes happen every time you go to Vainar. So, Gopi, I'm not going to be responding on the ecological problems. I think that I leave it to the experts like Tarun and other ecologists to talk about. But I am addressing economic problems that led to the ecological problems, the devastating uh, floods that we've seen in the last two years. What was that economic problem? The economic problem was that of procurement. You know, when you procure an item, you are interested in procuring it at the best price, in the largest volume, in the small, uh, lowest price possible. When you create an ecology of a procurement, I, I'll be using the word ecology here constantly, uh, you are encouraging monocropping. You're forcing intense agriculture you know, the farmer thinks that every square inch planted with coffee would give him that extra uh, rupee. If it is the same case whether you look at Punjab, you look at Madhya Pradesh, you know, the wheat and uh, yeah. a lot of the issues that you're seeing, uh, there's not a single tree left in Punjab you, uh, you drive across the state. But the same thing is happening in Vainan. So, you know, we cannot divorce uh, environmental and ecological issues. We cannot build this little cocoon that the ecological issues are concerns and we wring our hands as to what to do about it. Unless we address the fundamental economic issue of procurement, and this is precisely what we are trying to do uh, with the strength that we have in a place like Hawaii, is the local governance model, which is the 73rd Amendment, uh, so this, uh, which... Panchayat Act, the Panchayat Act, the Santa Cruz Act, and Kerala has implemented it uh, yeah. much better than most of the other states. Absolutely, yes. and the women's movement. The women came in in the Kudumbushi. The Kudumbushi you're talking about. Now, on this platform, uh, they tried to develop the cooperative movement. The cooperative movement had its challenges of in, uh, you know, uh, the inertia of institutions. But what we are now doing with technology is an aggregation uh, where small farmers can aggregate diverse produce, not just coffee. You give me your spices, you give me your bananas, you give me uh, your services. We will aggregate it and help you translate it to cash. We will make it, uh, you know, Federal Bank is partnering us, money goes into your bank account, and so on. Now, if you look at your know, beyond Wainad, and if you look at Kerala as a state, Kerala, the land of coconut trees. Yes, uh, and Wainad, the land of paddy fields. Why not? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the story is the same at a state level. The most fertile land, abundant water, this state is importing 80% of its produce. Believe it or not, it is importing five crores worth of something like eggs every day. Um, which, you know, you, every household could have chicken, but it's not happening. You could have your uh, your... Uh, horticulture crops are all coming in from the same, but it's not happening. Now, the issue is here back to procurement. Uh, the markets are not willing to procure uh, small quantities, and therefore the market structures of Kerala have totally collapsed. Land holding uh, after the land reform was 0.25 acres. Institutions haven't uh, changed. Kerala Agriculture University teaches the same syllabus as Punjab Agricultural University or Tamil Nadu Agriculture. Yeah, with totally different, different different agroecologies, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Now, we have to, and the, what we are trying to do, 
with coconut, with coffee, with spices, create an aggregation model where the farmer remains in control, the women remain in control, and they then create tra tradable volumes to actually take to the markets. This is actually a very, very fundamental uh, uh, switch in economics. From uh, economics of scarcity, you know, the cornerstone of all the economics that we learned in management school and elsewhere is about the traditional schools of scarcity. Whereas there is an alternative school of economics about abundance, about sharing, about giving, and not about hoarding. And that, I think, is what we will actually have to bring about. And this is the transformation that will actually start addressing the issues that Tarun is actually talking about. Interesting. I mean, you are talking something uh, like, the, like the Amul model. I mean, if I may paraphrase, something like the the Amul model, which of, of putting, uh, of aggregating rather than, you know, procurement model, which is top down. Uh, Tarun, uh, you know, uh, the Todas you mentioned are, are in the most pristine environment and because of the cultural practices, some of the, some of the environments are still kept very pristine because it also happens legally, they, they also happen to be uh, the core areas and, and the protected areas. So, uh, uh, Tell me, uh, have you thought of uh, anything like payment for ecosystem services? Because they've been they've been conserving. Uh, you know, this, this this the irony of biodiversity conservation. You have the people who conserve biodiversity live in uh, economic poverty. I mean, so so the only the, the incentive that can be given and and uh, and environment cannot be con you know, uh, cannot be conserved uh, sustainably when people are in poverty. So uh, have you been thinking about uh, some kind of a payment for ecosystem services uh, uh, for the Toda uh, community? Uh, yes, in many ways. I think the best way to, to make them self-sufficient uh, and uh, go, uh, become revert to being closer to nature would be to, for them to revert to their pastoralism. You know, it's very important. Uh, the government has made them coerce them into becoming unwilling farmers. And, but now they realize the value of the land. And uh, so I think if we can uh, ensure that they become pastoralists once again, and again, are able to derive a better income than they get from agriculture, most sustainably, then I feel that if we can help them to that uh, point, uh, then I think that is very much because their Toda temples are basically, uh, you know, as you know, their dairy temples. And uh, the, the, the Todas have been uh, pastoral people. And, and incidentally, as you know, the, the, the Toda buffalo itself, like their masters, is endemic to the Nilgiris. It's not found anywhere else in the world. So we'll be conserving uh, this endemic breed of uh, the water buffalo, Bobalis Bobalis, and the Toda cultural heritage. And once they revert to pastoralism stage by stage, uh, we're trying to do that actually even right now. We have a project on to study the Toda buffalo and propagate it. And all our buffaloes, which we have bought in these uh, pools, are being looked after by the Toda people themselves. So we are, uh, already started this process of getting them back to pastoralism. And uh, the second thing that we are working on is under the Forest Right Act is, you know, you have this community biodiversity, uh, you, you know, reserves like they have with the Sholagas and things like that. So we're trying to, with WWF, we're planning to do that in, with one of the Toda clans, the Kerer clan, and have a joint project where the uh, government and the, the Toda clan of that area, they manage that pristine ecosystem. And uh, a lot of the, this area where we're going to start this project, their, their uh, Pata land, as we call it, has not been farmed, it's still pristine. And wherever it has been farmed, we can give them incentives to actually uh, restore it back and, and we can give them incentives for that. And wherever people have left it pristine, we can give them incentives to uh, maintain that sustainably. And uh, another thing that we should do, I've been trying to do is that I made a presentation uh, at a conference uh, a short while ago where I made a plea uh, to UNESCO that the Toda landscape that includes the deity hills and its surrounding landscapes and the sacred water bodies, et cetera, should be given uh, you know, a world heritage status of a mixed category, uh, you know, or that means cultural and biodiversity value. And uh, so that is, that is up for consideration and that'll uh, give it tremendous value because this is like we mentioned, this is the core of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. And then finally, you know, it's, it's very important uh, that they, they're allowed to perform their ecosystem management practices like setting fire selectively literally to the using fire sticks to the grassland. And incidentally, the Toda still perform 
uh, indirect uh, ecosystem uh, practices. Can you imagine they go up to these deity hills during different seasons of the year and they actually pray, even today, they go up and they pray for ecosystem well-being. They go and in April, they'll go above uh, this uh, Paikala River to the hill posh and they'll pray to the Paikala River deity for ecological well-being and blessing. And during all the four different seasons of the year, even today, a failure of any Toda clan, any of the 15 Toda clans, a failure to perform during the different seasons of the year, the, the salt pouring ceremonies for the sacred buffaloes is deemed as an invitation for ecological disaster. So if you don't do the sacred salt water rites, say in April, May, the monsoon will, is going to be a failure. And similarly, in, during the frost season. So the indirect method, they still continue to follow. And uh, so I think we should honor these people and help them to revert back to pastoralism. And that's the project we're trying to do now. It's in its early stages. And, uh, you know, that, that will really help them a lot. Yeah, cons considering that we have so many, uh, I mean, increasing frequency of uh, uh, droughts and floods and extreme weather events, uh, I think prayer for ecological uh, uh, services and ecological peace is, is something that uh, we all can benefit from, uh, not just from TODAs and perhaps something that we can uh, learn and you know practice. Uh, so very interesting what you said. Uh, 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 prevent uh, prevent uh, move to agri uh, agriculture. Give uh, protection, some kind of protection for their lands. Give recognition as a heritage site and help them continue their uh, uh, you know their practices. Very interesting. Let's go to the question which is which is upmost uh, uppermost in the minds of the present and also the future generations. Uh, climate change. Uh, Tarun, uh, how, how I mean, I, I'm sure the Todas uh, have been talking about climate change because they have been see, seeing changes coming. And what what is their uh, reading uh, from their uh, the, uh, from their practices on how to deal with climate change in the upper plateau? Uh, uh, Gopi, there have been innumerable instances of uh, TODA observations. In fact, I've even presented a paper at an international conference on this once, one time. And uh, I'll give you a few examples. You know, the TODA mythological story, it's basically an observation also, mentions that the first mists of the monsoon, as they come in from Kerala, they encircle this hill, which the British called as the Nilgiri Peak, but known to TODA as the deity hill of Kashgol. And just like you, uh, you perambulate around a sacred shrine, the first mists of the monsoon perambulate around this a sheer rocky massive of the Nilgiri peak or Tajgol. And then it goes to the other end of the Western Nilgiris to a hill known as Conte, another deity hill, where it does the same. And the Toda observation since centuries is that after it perambles these two peaks, then it goes and sets in, the monsoon sets in the southwesterly monsoon in the rest of the plateau. And right through the three or four months of the southwesterly monsoon, these two deity hills, Kajgol and Conte, can never, the peaks are never visible. And in the 90s, when I used to go out, during the so-called peak monsoon, the Todas would look at these peaks of these and be aghast and say, there's something happening in the climate because we are seeing for days on end sometimes, we are seeing the peaks of these two deity hills, uh, you know, exposed. And similarly, you know, the Todas, like I mentioned, they use the flowering cycles of plants, not only for seasonal indicators, but also as climatic indicators. There are many examples of that. And during the, uh, the peak monsoon in July, they have a plant, it's an anemone, which they call, which in Toda translates as a Mosnod season flower, which mass flowers on the grasslands. And now it's getting more and more scarce. We have to actually search for it, you know? And because what's happening now is, even in the last few years, you notice in July, during the peak monsoon, when this monsoon season flower is supposed to mass flower, you have bright sunshine. So a lot of these indicator species are now becoming scarce. And so the TODAs can point out climate change. They don't know what's happening on a glo global scale, of course, but they can point out all the time that there's something happening in our climate and these are the changes. And of course, uh, you know, Gopi, just as an aside, uh, you might be, you will be aware that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the climatic changes that occurred in the Pleistocene era did contribute to the development of the biodiversity to some extent uh, or a large extent that we found in the Nilgiris today. So, but it wasn't anthropogenic, of course, but, yeah. uh, you know, much of it developed during this harsh climatic period. So some plants went extinct and some species evolved into new species. Just something for you to chew on and remember, because people don't notice this uh, there. And uh, 
you know the toda is also there's there's certain very sacred toda uh, uh, temple complexes where the entire ecosystem be it shola grassland wetland the entire thing of sometimes several hundred acres is treated as inviolate by the todas and because of this many of these uh, complexes sacred temple complexes with this natural pristine ecosystem even today has its own microclimate which kind of insulates it these places from climate changes to a large extent so this is how the todas have been offsetting and addressing these climatic changes and also they understand for example which are the hydrologic conservation species and they preserve them and conserve them and see that they are abundant around their water bodies so that there's water flowing in the sacred streams because every toda hamlet you know has a separate water source for the domestic use another for the ordination of the dairyman priest another for the, only the temple use another for the uh, pregnancy rites another for the salt water ceremonies etc so can if you have to have half a dozen water sources around each a tiny toda hamlet you have to preserve the water sources and especially you're opening your dairy temples during the dry winter and summer months so this is how they've been addressing and recognizing these climatic changes uh, in their habitat very keenly i mean if if only we could uh, we could uh, you know conserve these traditional knowledges and as you mentioned uh, you know under the convention on biological diversity uh, and india being the first country to have have the biodiversity law uh, in uh, not just conservation of biodiversity but its traditional knowledge so if only we could uh, uh, conserve this biodiversity i mean uh, we can perhaps and the traditional knowledge and, and we can perhaps uh, you know work towards greater climate res resilience on the upper plateau back to vinard ajit i mean how will your how do your father farmers uh, look at climate resilience and what are the climate change issues that 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 is being faced in vinard i mean the construction activities like in nilgiri's upper plateau lower plateau it's mostly the same but what are the specific issues of of vinard again i'd probably like to start with uh, wasan bosco you know the uh, uh, the person who's continues to support us on the uh, shola grasslands uh, project in school yeah he wrote a book with a very haunting name the voice of the sentient highlands yeah and i think that is something that tarun we heard tarun sort of in this uh, you know heard so much uh, of what tarun is in talking about i relate to a lot of what uh, tarun is talking about because in biodynamics we talk about the stars the influence of the stars the constellations the moon phases and so on uh i'd like to probably again uh, go beyond uh, why not into a sort of a, a, a global position you know we've talked about school we moved up the ladder to talk about vinad i've talked briefly about uh, the uh, a program at the state level at the kerala i'd like to talk about uh, uh, environment and the issues at the perhaps at a global level i had the opportunity to attend uh, uh, last year the global forum for food and agriculture i was invited to speak at the inaugural session uh you know we talked about going to bed with the enemies uh, this time it was uh, the uh, uh, you know the chairman of bear monsanto not the best friend of the organic farmer uh the the managing director of uh, nestle the international director of uh, nestle uh, you did make a threesome didn't you pardon quite you did make a threesome no and uh, you know uh, m biome talking about biomes and the need for technology and small farmers and the rest of it you know what i took away from that uh, uh, you know that uh, three day uh, three days i was there uh, at the dfp the problems that we are facing in wynad is no different from the problems that we are facing in africa or the rest of asia uh degradation of the environment destruction of the environment poverty illness uh civil war are all all integrated you cannot separate the thing you cannot say i am a conservationist i'm going to look at conservation without addressing the, the issues of economics a point that i've been uh, repeating over and over again i do believe the most powerful form and the most stable form of governance is the local government the local government across asia and we created what is called now for the asian local government organic agriculture uh in the local governments we are talking about the women the youth 
who have to be engaged in this transformation. And we're not just talking about organic agriculture here. We are talking about restoring biomes. The work of my company, M-Biome, is about embryonic biome, restoring biomes. This is what we need to be working towards. In conclusion, I would like to talk about, you know, but Tarun has been talking a lot about sacredness. Sacredness of the mountains, the rivers, the streams, the stars. I would like to talk about the sacredness of economics. And I'm repeating myself again, that there is an alternative to scarcity. There is an alternative to hoarding and creating just wealth. There is the alternative of giving, of abundance. And I think this is the economic model that will come when we shift from procurement to aggregation. Aggregation has a soul in it. It's a people's moment. It is people aggregating together to give their produce. I would encourage all of you students who are here. There are two books that have actually made a, a very significant influence on me. Uh, the first one is uh, 1971, Schumacher's Essays in All is Beautiful. And a book uh, much, much more recent by Schumacher, uh, sorry, uh, Eisenstein, 2000, 2015, 2014, 2015 is when it was published, uh, which you know I relate to, and he probably says what I would have liked to say much better than I could have said. The name of the book is Sacred Economics. How do we find that sacredness back into economics? Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, Tarun. I mean, that was you. one <laughs> wonderful discussion of some. I mean, that's the new word we have learned from uh, from Tarun. Uh, though we are we are uh, we are talking on a Saturday, not a Sunday, but still, I mean, it is it is awesome in, in English and in uh, and in the Toda language. What, uh, what is interesting is uh, Ajit, you concluded by talking about sacredness of economics, and uh, and Tarun was talking about sacredness of of rivers, mountains, hills, uh, etc. So we are talking of sacredness. And and this also we've also brought down to the discussion to what what we can do as individuals and in our professional lives and this is of real importance for uh, you know Laurentians like us because it's not just our we we do take action in in our regular personal lives you know like 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 uh, you know use of, uh, the problem is most of us have forgotten over a period of time. Uh, the, the ecological footprint of our action. So in, in our personal lives, if we come back to the ecological footprint of the bottle of water that we use, you know, where is the water coming from? Uh, where is the plastic going to? I and, mean, you know, my classmate Sumak Desai has hundreds of such examples and such le uh, such lessons he talks about. But then that's, that's, that has limitations, you know, as Amitav Ghosh uh, talks in The Great Derangement. I mean, there's, there's, there's limitations to what private personal action can do. So at a certain level, the system has to take over, the governance structures have to take over. And that's, that, that's exactly the point you, Ajit, brought out in your, in your, uh, with, with the governance structure and involvement of communities and, uh, and, and how the system has to take over. And, and we, for us, uh, we also have, most of us have official responsibilities. We, are, we, are, we run organizations, we are part of corporates. So what are some of the decisions we take there is, is different from the implications of the decisions we take in our personal life. So this is, I mean, if we remember uh, uh, what we, uh, what we remember the say, Toda lesson or the lesson of economics of the farmer, uh, perhaps we, we all can become better environmental citizens. Back to you, uh, Rohan.